While Pierre Florins achieved the titles physiologist and surgeon, his work had a tremendous impact on the field of psychology. Florins believed in seamless brain functioning, meaning he theorized the brain working as a whole rather than as individualized components. He dedicated half of his life to his theories on cerebral equal potentiality and would become phrenology's worst nemesis by disproving many of the field's main beliefs. While much of Florenz's life still remains a mystery, his legacy within the field of science continues to live on today. After conducting a vast amount of research, it is safe to say that Pierre Florenz's life appears to have sprung out of midair. Little documentation exists today about Pierre's life prior to the age of 19 including information about his family, socioeconomic status, and educational background. The only known fact about Florenz's early life was his birth in the spring of 1794 in Morlion, France. Beginning in 1813, Florenz resurfaces within literature. Florenz received his medical degree from the University of Montpellier in Montpellier, France, at the age of 19, displaying his interest in anatomy. After receiving his degree, Florenz worked under the direction of Augustine de Condel and Georges Cuvier. While both individuals worked directly with Florenz, it was Cuvier who intrigued Florenz to pursue a path relating to anatomy and neurology. Twenty years after graduation in 1833, Florenz became employed at the Collège de France as a professor of anatomy. However, this only lasted five years as Florence got involved in the political side of society by becoming a deputy of commune of Beziers in 1838. During his time in politics, he was elected into the French Academy and given the Légion d'Honneur. It wasn't until 1855 that Florence went back to his teachings when he obtained employment at the Collège de France as a professor of natural history until his death in 1867 in Paris. While Florenz's interest with understanding brain functioning may have sparked during his time in medical school, his passion for anatomy flourished while under the direction of Georges Cuvier. Cuvier was both a paleontologist and zoologist who was credited for founding the field of paleontology. Cuvier spent most of his life studying fossil fragmentations and even aided in creating a classification system for the animal kingdom. Cuvier believed that by studying a single rudiment of an animal, he could recreate the animal as a whole. Cuvier thought of animal limbs, organs, nerves, and behaviors as all working together as a whole organism, rather than paying specific attention to each anatomical feature as having its own separate purpose. Cuvier's ideas of wholeness acted as a basis for Florenz's theories on brain functioning in his attempts to disprove the ideas of phrenology. Without being introduced to Cuvier's understanding of animal functioning behavior, Florenz may have never had the correct interpretation of mental processes needed to accurately understand one's nervous system, leaving him without a legacy to leave behind. During Florence's time in professorship, he took on many pupils and taught them his theories of neuroanatomy. Two of these pupils, Alfred Volpain and Gabriel Valentin, are highly noted within the literature pertaining, pertaining to Florence due to their further contributions in the realm of science. Valentin gained historical recognition through his creation of the first ever embryology textbook. He also published multiple studies pertaining to the structure of nerve tissue within the brain and spinal cord. Volpain, on the other hand, became one of the founders of modern day neurology. He also gained respect within society as a whole through his position as Dean of Paris Faculty of Medicine. Before one can fully appreciate Florenz's contribution to modern day neurological understanding, they must first understand how and where the field of neuroanatomy was during the 17th to 18th century. During the late 17th century, a physician by the name of Joseph Gall founded the field of phrenology. While phrenology is no longer around today, thanks to the critiques of Florence, the field obtained a vast amount of popularity during this time. Society favored phrenology's belief that each individual contained unique qualities and its ability to detect individuals with special and or enhanced contributions beginning at a young age. According to the theories of phrenology, human qualities and attributions could be determined by studying the shape of one's skull. For example, 
Goodwin states that Gall believed individuals with protruding eyes had better memory capabilities than individuals with concaved eye features. Gall believed that specific human faculties could be found on specific areas of the brain and that the size of each of these brain areas determined how much of that trait was visible within the individual's personality behavior. Gull identified over 36 different faculties located on the surface of one's brain, ranging from intelligence to athleticism to sexual. It is important to note that while Florenz is credited with disproving the theories behind phrenology, he at one point or another is noted to have admired Gull's work. However, this changed after his mentorship with George Gouvier, who introduced Florenz to the idea of anatomical entirety. Once Florenz began noticing flaws within the beliefs of phrenology, he began to spend over 40 years disproving phrenologists' anatomical understanding through the use of rational and empirical evidence. In order to disprove phrenology's theories, Florenz relied on the experimental method known as ablation. During ablation, the experimenter intentionally creates damage to differing areas of living organisms' brain and observes any changes in behavior. This may be a good time to note that Florence did mainly experiments on puppies, birds, and rabbits within his laboratory. What Florence found at the beginning of his experimentation was that many of the areas of the brain that phrenologists theorized to have controlled one behavior actually controlled a completely different behavior. For example, when Florence lacerated an animal's cerebellum, the animal lost a substantial amount of muscle movement, equilibrium, and coordination. This disproves the phrenologist's idea that the area Florence lacerated was in charge of determining one's sexual motivation and intellectual ability. A second example is displayed when Florence damaged an animal's medulla, a structure thought by phrenologists to be the center of one's personality characteristics. What Florence found, who said, was that the medulla served the purpose in an animal of respiratory and circulatory functioning, and that when it was lacerated, the animal died almost immediately. A final example of Florence's work in identifying brain structures inaccurately labeled by phrenologists was when he lacerated pigeon semicircular canals. While phrenologists believed that the semicircular canals determines one accuracy in hearing, Florence found that when damaged, the animal's posture, not auditory response, was hindered. Throughout his attempts to disprove phrenology, Florence is credited with properly labeling both the position and function of differing brain structures, allowing for a more accurate understanding and illustration of the central nervous system. However, these were not the discoveries that made Florence unforgivable within history. Florence's main contribution to the field of psychology and neurology was his discovery that the cortex of the brain works as a uniform whole, rather than as individualized faculties. Florence labeled this idea as cerebral equal potentiality, displaying the importance of fluidity and entirety in the entire cerebral cortex. As Florence continued to use ablation methods on the brains of animals, he found that the amount of damage he created was directly proportional to the impediment displayed within the animal's behavior. The discovery that the cortex worked as a whole rather than as separate individualized faculties acted as the final findings needed to disprove the ideas of phrenology in their entirety. While some may be troubled by Florence's use of ablation in order to obtain accurate results, especially when it came to the intentional harm of animals, they should first be aware of the time frame of which Florence was working under. According to Bowden Shapiro, the 40s and the 60s marked a time where electroconvulsive shock, punishment, and brain lesioning were not only common, but acceptable forms of experimentation within psychology. For it wasn't until 1975, long after Florence's time, that the animal rights movement began targeting psychology to stop the crude use of animals within experimentation. And then six years later, the APA Code of Ethics began protecting animals. While Florence's work may appear to be inhumane, it is always important to step back and understand the time frame under which experimenters are conducting their experiments. Some further critiques for the accomplishments of, of Florine is his ability to take matters into his own hand instead of relying on information being passed on by authority. Florine shows that every theory is capable of flaws and further exemplifies the importance of retesting in order to ensure that one's results are accurate and precise. While these critiques may seem minuscule to his discoveries of anatomical brain structure, 
Lorraine's opens up doors to accurately understanding behaviors at an anatomical level. For without knowledge of where behaviors originate from, it is impossible for psychologists to offer any form of aid or accurate observations pertaining to a specific behavior.